All right, well, welcome to week 24. We're almost halfway. Uh, so th this week, um, the it, it really covers really covers Solomon's life the uh, from the time he becomes king uh, till his death uh, and, and while it gives us some pretty ugly information uh, you know and, and and you piece together some of the stuff uh, you learn a lot about Solomon in a little short block of scripture there um, one of the things that I guess I want to look at today is, the time, kind of the thought process is character. Um, people with great potential are sometimes met with major character flaws. Okay, and I think today we're going to see major character flaws come in place. Huge potential, but great disaster of results coming from that. Uh, potential. Some of the results that come from somebody that's got great potential but has great character flaws, um, from a, an individual standpoint, they can it can be individual disasters. Okay, it can come from just the individual himself, you know, with character flaws. Uh, then if you take it to the a little bit bigger, well, it can have family disasters written all over it. Okay. And then if you take it even to the next level as from a community disaster standpoint, you can have disaster that can come from character flaws that can affect a community. And that doesn't just mean a, like a city or a town. I mean, it can, it can mean a, a church community. I mean, just this week, I don't know if any of y'all saw it, but this week there were 18 people so far, the TBI is arrested, and one of the 18 is a youth pastor from uh, around the Nashville area and it's on what it's on human trafficking child exploitation charges okay this is a youth pastor and of course that's what's going to make the news not the other 17 that were involved just the one okay and so those are flaws okay it can be so you think that's going to have ramifications across a community that's going to have the, the local church that he was involved in, that's going to be a big one. But outside of that, I mean, the name of Christ is going to get stained all over the state of Tennessee and anywhere else that that thing travels, the news of that. So you've got character flaws from that. And then you can have, depending on somebody's position, you can have natural or uh, national level disasters that come from character flaws. Okay? You can have one or two people in a, in a high-ranking position. If they got character issues... It can be disastrous for well, a whole nation or a whole group of people. So I just finished reading a book called Sailing True North, and I had a few weeks ago brought just one little quote I had pulled out of it, but I just finished it, and it's about, it's about character. Okay? And it was looking at, it's written by an admiral, recently retired admiral, and he was looking at 10 admirals across the spectrum of history. Okay? of different places, not just the United States, across history. Ten admirals, and it was called the Sailing Tree Road. It was looking at character, and it was really saying, these guys, and it was kind of pointing out, saying their character was headed a true north. Well, as I read the book, and when I finished reading the book, I argued when I wrote, and I usually write it on books I write in there and stuff, my thoughts, and I argued with the author on this about the fact that Really, only two of the ten that he talked about really had were were men of character that were headed. I mean, nobody's headed true north. I mean, there's not been one person that's got character that's ever walked this earth that's been perfect. That was Jesus. But other than that, there's only two of the ten that that you could say their life was a life of character. The rest of them had character traits, but had character flaws. And so when you put the whole piece together, you couldn't really say that they were, they were men of character, okay? They may have had some traits. They may, have, they may have had, you know, they were resilient, but they were womanizers. They may have been great tacticians, but at times they were murderers. 
Okay, you can't really say they were their their whole of their life was a was a life of character. You could just say they had pieces, but you did have two that I think that history's gone down to say these two men had were men of great character. Okay, so the idea of finishing strong or running our race or a life of character all kind of have the same thought process. They all come from that total person. The stuff you can the stuff you can see in public, but that's nowhere near as important as the stuff that you can't see. When nobody else is watching. Okay? I, I don't know about you, but I, I would hate one of these days, and when we know of people that this have happened to, people think, man, these people have been men or women of great character, and then after they're gone, the stuff that comes out of the closet that shocks everybody. Okay? Out there in the public, they did a real good job of hiding the private, but there was the public side that made everybody think that. Okay? And, and there's been people even in recent years in the Christian community that that's exactly what's happened, okay? has come out that way. When I was in college and uh, I looked, I've got the book on my desk, I grabbed it and pulled it out. It's called, a book called Finishing Strong. And here's, honestly, I read this book in like 1995. I have no idea... I can't tell you what the book, what's in the book. It's been a long time, since 1995. But I know I either read all of it or part of it, but I do know that for the last 15 years, I've always remembered the book, and the title being Finishing Strong gives you kind of an idea of where it's headed, right? And so I've always had the kind of that end in mind when you're looking, that's part of the character. I don't want to come back after I'm gone and one of these days people start pulling out of the closet going, hey, look at all this. He sure didn't, he didn't do well. Or he didn't finish well. Okay? He started great, but then he collapsed. Okay? Solomon, he started good. He don't finish well. Okay? And I think we can learn from him some of those type of things today. And, and I want to kind of dig in a little bit. So in 1 Kings chapter 10, we'll start out by looking at how about the wealth that Solomon attained. If you remember, he's gonna he built the temple. God had come to him. Actually, God comes to him twice. And he's built the temple and all these things. And God asks him, what do you want? And Solomon says, I want wisdom to be able to what? Shepherd your people. Starts well. God says, okay, since you're asking for that, I'll give you all the rest of it. Okay. So here's the wisest man the Bible says ever lived. Okay? He's got all this knowledge. He's got all this wisdom. He's going to have all the ability to produce all kinds of wealth right, and all these things, and he starts well. Okay? But in his wisdom allowed him to start to accumulate great wealth and great power, and with wealth and power comes great problems with pride, with self-importance, with lust of any type. In his case, yeah, I guess you could make the argument women was one of them, but the other one and the main one we're looking at here is power and wealth. He lusted for those things. And even when he had what it looked like was all he could handle, it still wasn't enough. He still kept on wanting more and more. So Solomon becomes so engrossed in building his kingdom, and he's doing it by force, He's making everybody into his puppets and his slaves. Not just the countries around them that they have taken over and all those people groups that they've put under, that really David had put under their control. Not just them, but he's also doing this to his own people. The people of Israel, God's people. That God was giving them what? A, a land and an inheritance, and here Solomon, as he starts, which he starts well, as for wisdom to be able to shepherd, but he, what, over time, all that wisdom and all that importance and all that stuff start to what? Start to work on him. And he's, I think this, I think as 
the power and the wealth continue to build at an alarmingly huge rate, the corruption starts to happen. Okay? Not just him personally, but I think too inside his government and all of his little tentacles that he had out all over everything, the corruption starts. So what he does is he proves what can happen to the best of people with the best of intentions when they don't keep themselves in check, which comes from the character side of things. Okay. So even though he's had, he's had two visions from God, and he's desired to walk with the Lord, his father gave him charge and says, to, to do all this, you need to stay walking with the Lord. His father gave him everything was already put under control. Okay? Solomon didn't have to go out to war. David had done all that. Okay? Even after having all this wisdom, God-given wisdom, okay? all these things, he's built the temple. I mean, come on, he built, built the temple for God, for Yahweh, for Israel's God. He gets to build that, and his great intellect and wisdom carry him into starting to reach in and push in toward more and more power and wealth. Okay? He frustrated and mistreated his own people. Okay? And why? Not for their benefit, but only for, for his. Okay? And then his wealth and power, he started to allow foreigners and foreign influences in and above God's people. That was political and economic stuff he started. Well, see, in a minute, he had what? He had 700 wives, and it's going to tell us they were princesses. Most of them were probably, they were royal weddings. They were, they were the connections to all these other little people groups out there and their royal stuff. This was not, this was about economics and stuff. And as they moved in and they had influence, their influence is Solomon's working on his wealth and his kingdom. And these people are starting to get more and more influence and they're getting more and more importance over who? All the people of Israel who are getting poorer and poorer. Okay? While Solomon and his group of all of his people, they're getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. Okay? So look at chapter 10, verse 14. The weight of gold that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons of gold. And that, doesn't be, that does not count what came from merchants, traders, merchandise, all the Arabian kings and governors of the land. This is just people, the countries that are under their control that have to give tribute, have to pay tribute to Solomon every year. 25 tons. I did a quick calculation. Okay. In our day, right now, that's $1.16 trillion annually he's collecting in gold. Not what he's getting from the merchants and everybody else that wants to do business. Okay. This is just off of the other. And he's got his little tentacles, what, out everywhere. Okay? Gold's coming in. And where's he getting the ability to do this? He's got great wisdom. The problem is, God can give you all kinds of gifts, and you can use them for good, or you can, what, use them for your own selfish desires. And he's going to head that direction. Okay? I mean, come on. 1.16 trillion. I don't think I need multiple years of that. I could probably do with just, what, half of one year. We'd call it your lifetime. Okay? So he's getting all this at that level. Now, skip down to verse 23. King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the world in riches and in wisdom. I mean, he reigns for 40 years at over a trillion dollars a year in gold. Okay? The whole world wanted an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Every man would bring his annual tribute, items of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. Okay? And then look at verse 26. Solomon accumulated 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen and stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. So he's got little cities out there, and he's got these chariots. I mean, look, if you took these things in, in our day, what would this be? This would be like having tanks and fighter jets. Okay? You got both. 
Hey, why? You're going to control it all. The one who's got the ability to control the air controls it all. Okay? He's got, he's got, what? he didn't have to fight battles. What's he doing? In his wisdom, now he thinks, I've got all this. Now I've got to start what? Building my kingdom, and I need to make sure I've got all my stuff protected. So he starts in the process of getting the chariots. Okay? David conquered them, Solomon's inherited them, and he's what? Put together a way to try to figure out how to hold on and to make sure his wealth doesn't change. Then look at verse 28. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and Cuba. The king's traders brought them from Cute at the going price. A chariot was imported from Egypt for 15 pounds of silver and a horse for nearly 4 pounds. In the same way, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram through their agents. You know what Solomon became? The first Middle Eastern arms trader. It's honestly exactly what he became. Think about it. What's he doing? He's getting his chariots, and then he decides, hey, you know what? I can make money by selling arms. To who? All the countries around Israel that hate Israel. That ought to tell you he's not looking out for the best interest of the people. He's only looking at what? His own wallet. That's all he's worried about, his kingdom. So he's selling to Israel's enemies and future enemies. Why? Because he doesn't have the vision at this point. He's not looking at anybody else's future down the road. He's only concerned about himself. It's all about the money. Okay? A, lot of people, a lot of people have been in arms and sold arms to other places, and they sell it to their own enemies. Why? Because it's all about the money. Okay? He becomes the first arms dealer. And he's selling to countries that are going to be... Who wouldn't? Egypt's got chariots and Israel's got chariots. Who wouldn't want the opportunity to own chariots? Because otherwise you're like shooting spit wads at an army coming at you. Okay? So he's making money off of this. Not for the people of Israel and not even for their safety. Just for his own kingdom. For his own pocketbook. Okay? Now, chapter... 11. Chapter 11, in all his wisdom, and God gave him wisdom. In all his wisdom, here's where the failure comes in, and God, God brings it to point right here in this chapter. Okay? Chapter 11, verse 1. King Solomon loved many foreign women, in addition to Pharaoh's daughter. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, and they must not intermarry with you because they will turn your heart away to follow their gods. And if I remember correctly, God's been saying this before Solomon. He was saying it before David. He said it all the way back with what? He said it all the way back with Moses. And Joshua, okay, which at this point, 500 years before, okay, when they were fixing to go into the land, if you intermarry, what's going to happen? You're going to fall, okay? You're going to fall. Now, he's not meaning, because it didn't rule out all women that were from foreign seas. Because, look, Ro Ruth is a perfect case in point. She's a Moabitess. But she had done what? She had pledged allegiance and she had moved her faith from Moab to where? The God of Israel. Okay? So this is about being unequally yoked. Apply that to you know, New Testament Christianity. It's about being unequally yoked. Okay? Because if one person is walking with the Lord and the other one is not, it never usually works out well for the one who's walking with the Lord. The other one will always pull them away from the Lord. Okay. And he says, "Who turned their heart away to follow their gods?" To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. He had seven hundred wives who were princesses and three hundred who were concubines, and they turned his heart away. There's those princesses part. Okay. These were political 
as well as economics, but also eh, he seemed to have liked his women at the tune of 700 plus 300. Okay? It's a lot. But they turned his heart away. Verse 4, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. Not that he just let them do stuff. It turned what? His heart away. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God as his father David had been. David never got into idolatry. He may have got into a lot of women. He never got into idolatry. Okay. Solomon followed the Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidon and Milcom, the abhor abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. Okay? Didn't remain loyal. This is the guy who built the temple. This is the guy who asked for wisdom. This is a smart, smart guy. And he didn't have enough wisdom to stay following the Lord. Why? Our hearts, pride, and greed, and sin, and all those type of things that start to creep in, what? No matter how much we, and look, we sometimes know something's going to hurt, right? And we still do what? Do it anyway. Okay? Solomon had the wisdom to be able to know and see the outcomes of stuff, and he still what? He turned and walked away from the Lord. He did not remain loyal. At the time, verse 7, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abhorrent idol of Moab, and for Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites, on the hill across from Jerusalem. And you know what these I, you know what these places of worship they did? They sacrificed. You know what they sacrificed? Child sacrifice. You could probably, from the temple of Yahweh, you could probably see this witness. Right across the thing over there. You could probably see it from there. And what were they doing over there? Solomon built the temple and now they're over here and they're what? They're doing child sacrifice in, in Jerusalem right there. And if y'all remember correctly, God's been very, 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 very clear what will happen when you do this. And he was very, very, very clear with Solomon in chapter 9 about if you do this. And what are they doing? They're doing it right there. Not just in Israel in general. Right there in Jerusalem. Okay. Verse 9. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had commanded him about this so that he would not follow other gods. But Solomon did not do what the Lord had commanded. Again, that was chapter 9. Okay. Then the Lord said to Solomon, Since you have done this and did not keep my covenant... And my statutes, which I commanded you, I will tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Which is also what God said he would do. Okay. However, I will not do it during your lifetime for the sake of your father David. If you remember, Solomon, there was he was told that Solomon would reign and he would he would be able to live in peace, okay? And it wouldn't happen yet. Then what happened in his reign? But see, God already knew. And he gave Solomon a warning. Just because God knew and Solomon, Solomon still had the choices to make, Solomon chose to what? Follow off on all this other stuff instead of staying with the wisdom God had given him. Okay? Doing his own thing. Building his own kingdom. And so here he is at this point to where God says, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you. Okay? And I'm going to give it to your servant. Not your son. I'm going to I'm give it to one of those guys that's a servant. Now, how in the world could he find? Heck, everybody in that area was a servant of his. Okay? But there is one guy that's going to get this. But, verse 12, However, I will not do it during your lifetime for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of your son's hand. That means what? Heck, all the nation of Israel is not going to continue with David, Solomon, in this case, Rehoboam, and keep on going. No, no. There's going to be a line of the tribe of Judah. There's going to be a tribe. There's going to be a, there's going to be a small kingdom. God's going to reduce him in size dramatically. Okay? But the big picture of the nation of Israel is not going to stay with Solomon and his family. It's going to go to another guy. I will give it to one tribe 
Uh, yet I will not tear the entire kingdom away from him. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem that I chose. Well, that one tribe that's got Jerusalem and it's right there, that's Judah. Okay? And then in the process, God's going to start to weaken Solomon. He ain't going to take the kingdom away from him while he's alive. But he is because of the consequences of the way Solomon has treated people and acted and done things. Okay? Everybody, look, everybody to Solomon's face, probably everybody blessed him and oh, oh, live forever, oh king, type of thing. But he had, he had ticked off and had hurt and damaged so many people and relationships that we'll see when we get to his son how bad that gets. Okay? But God's going to start to weaken his kingdom up a little bit. Verse 14, as the Lord raised up Hadad the Edomite as an enemy against Solomon. Now, I ain't going to read all that, but here's a guy who, who King David and Joab had killed off, had gone into Edom and had killed off all the men. This dad was a young guy, was a boy, him and some others, and they were able to escape. And they went off to, I think it was Egypt for a while. He comes back. He's never going to like Israel. He comes back, and he's going to be a thorn in the side of Solomon. Okay? And then look over at verse 23. Chapter 11, verse 23. God raised up Razon. And then skip down to 25. Razon was Israel's enemy throughout Solomon's reign, adding to the trouble Hadad had caused. He reigned over Aram and loathed Israel. He's another one that's got a real good reason why he can't stand and hates Israel. Okay? And what's God doing? It says God raised him up, right? God's letting the, what? He letting it to start weakening up, weakening up this little reign that Solomon's got and what he's been pulling. <clears throat> Verse 26, now Solomon's servant Jeroboam, son of Naboth, was an Ephraimite from Jerudah. His widowed mother's name was Jeruah. Jeroboam rebelled against Solomon. And this is the reason he rebelled against the king. Solomon had built the supporting terraces and repaired the opening in the wall of the city of his father David. All so well, so good. Now the man Jeroboam was capable. Again, very good. And Solomon noticed the young man because he was getting things done. That sounds really good, right? There's no reason yet to rebel. So he appointed him over the entire labor force of the house of Joseph. He just got a promotion. But it says this is the reason he rebelled. Well, a couple things that we can know from this. One, Joseph means that they're what? They're forced labor. They're Israelites. That means Solomon's got them in slavery, right? And Ephraimite, he's an Ephraimite. Well, guess what? The tribe, Joseph isn't one tribe. He's Ephraim and Manasseh. So this means he's put this guy who is from the tribe of one of the sons of Joseph, he's put him in a position of being the slave driver over his own people. Think that might make you mad? Imagine slaves, and you ought, you ought to be one of them, but instead you just got put as a slave driver over the top of them? Might make you mad. So this is letting us know that A, he puts a guy who's from the tribe from a tribe of Joseph in there, but it's also letting us know that Solomon has what? He's enslaved his own people. Okay? Which has caused this guy to rebel. Okay? You don't like it. During that time, the prophet Ahijah, the Shilamite, Shilonite, met Jeroboam on the road as Jeroboam came out of Jerusalem. We got a prophet shows up to this guy, Jeroboam. Okay? Verse 31. And he said to Jeroboam, take ten pieces for yourself. He has ripped up his cloak, his cloak into twelve pieces. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says, I'm about to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I will give you ten tribes, but one tribe will remain as uh, 
remained his for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem. Okay. For they have abandoned me. They have bowed down to the Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidonians, to Chemosh, the god of Moab, and to Milcom, the god of the Ammonites. They have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my sight and to carry out my statutes and my judgments as his father David did. Pretty good. You got a you you now you already don't like David. And you got a prophet just come and says, I'm gonna tear the kingdom out and I'm gonna give you ten tribes. That's eighty four percent of the nation of Israel. And I'm fixing to, I'm just gonna tear it out and I'm gonna give it to you. You're fixing to inherit. 84% of the nation Israel. Okay. Verse 34, however, I will not take the whole kingdom from him, but will let him be ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David. I'm not going to do it during Solomon's lifetime. You're not going to get this while Solomon's alive. Okay. Whom I chose and kept my commands and statutes. Um, verse 35, I will take ten tribes from the kingdom from his son and give them to you. I will give one tribe to his son so that my servant David will always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city I chose for myself to put my name there. Verse 37, I will appoint you and you will reign as king over all you want and you will be the king over Israel. There's going to be one that's going to remain as the tribe of king of Judah. But Israel, 84% of it is going with you. Okay, Once King Solomon's dead. After that, verse 38, if you obey all my commands, now all that command, you walk in my ways and do what's right in my sight in order to keep my statutes and my commands as my servant David did, I will be with you. I will build you into a lasting dynasty just as I built for David. And I will give you Israel. I will humble David's descendants because of their unfaithfulness, but not forever. He's looking down the road, what, for the line of the tribe of Judah. He's going to humble them up now. It's not going to stay a dynasty that's going to rule all that. Okay? And why? Because of Solomon's sin. Great sin. But see, it's not just Solomon because he did what? He was shepherd and he led the people where? Into great sin. Okay? It right, does rise and fall on leadership. Okay? Now, verse 40, first part of that, tell me who this sounds like. Therefore, Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam. That sound like anybody else that knew the kingdom was being ripped from them, and they knew who it was, and they tried to kill him? Sounds like Saul, doesn't it? Saul found out he wasn't going to keep the kingdom. It was going to be ripped from you. It's going to be given to this little dude named David. And then what did he do? He tried to kill him. Jeroboam. So, apparently... Somehow, words come to Solomon that says, Hey, the prophet said that Jeroboam's taking your kingdom. And so what does he do? The wise, great Solomon, what? Tries to kill him. Okay. Of course, he's going to flee to Egypt. Okay. I think Solomon knows how he's been treating people. I think he knows what's going on. How do I know that? Well, y'all know there's that little book that's in this. We don't have time to talk about it, but the book of Ecclesiastes. It's kind of an interesting book. Okay? But some of the things that Solomon says, you realize that he knows what's going on. The problem is he just doesn't seem to have much care for his own people. Because again, he's not worried about this being the shepherd over Israel. He's worried about what? His own self. For an example, Ecclesiastes 5, 8, 9. He talks about that the poor will be victims of corruption. Government corruption. Now, how in the world would he figure out that? Because that was probably happening, wouldn't you think? And whose government was doing it? His own. He doesn't do anything to stop it. He acknowledges that it happens. But that's the extent of it. See, he wasn't trying to build the wealth of the nation. He was just trying to build the wealth of himself. In the process, he's made all the people who God had given them an inheritance. 
And God had given them this land. And what's he doing? He's stealing, in essence, the value of their land. For what? For his own purposes. Just like he was a trader for um, the, uh, the arms trading, he's also trading in everything else. Where's he getting all that stuff? From what should have been the people's inheritance, but he's made them slaves. He's getting all this from them. So he knows that the poor are being victimized. He just doesn't do anything about it. Or the next verse, he even says that the love of money never satisfies. Well, heck, I think he knows this probably better than anybody else. Has it changed anything? No. God gave him wisdom. All right? But he still didn't use it in a holy way. Not his whole life. Okay. Now, he's put all the people under his dominion, under his control. And so when he dies, his son Rehoboam would have been the natural next person to take over the entire thing. Okay, Remember I said at the beginning, the individual failure well, the next one's family, family failure. I think we've already seen where the whole nation itself is going to be a disaster because of his failures okay? and, and, and communities. But even his family, his own sons, okay, the way that they come out. Look at chapter 12. I just want to look at a little of this, and we're, it's where we're going to close out. Chapter 12. Then Rehoboam went to Shechem. For all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. Okay? He's headed out there. He's thinking he's going to get king. Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, heard about it. He had been in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon's presence. Jeroboam stayed in Egypt. But they summoned him and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. Y'all right. remember when David or, uh, well, when David was, was anointed king? When he actually took over? All the tribes came together and they agreed and they anointed him their king. Okay? And then David, remember that they, there was the one son tried to take over the kingdom and pull it out of Solomon's hand. And David said, no, take him, send him, put him on my mule and, 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 and take him up here and, and lay hands on him and anoint him king. Okay? And he became king. So now it's time for Rehoboam. Okay? And he thinks he's going to inherit the whole thing. So they've gone out there. Now, they've come to have a discussion with the king. Verse 3 again. But they summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. Verse 4. Your father made our yoke harsh. You, therefore, lighten your father's harsh service and heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. These ain't foreigners. These are the tribes. These are the tribes of Israel going, hey, you know what? Your father, Solomon, has put such a heavy burden on us. We ask you to, if you will back it down a notch. Don't, they ain't even asking for you to leave us alone. You'll back that burden down. You know what? We'll consider you king. We, we'll go with that. Okay? Sounds like a pretty reasonable request. Because okay? here's the thing. Brad Bohm's not dumb. He knows what his daddy's been doing. All of Israel knows what's going on. You know, If he's a smart guy and wants to keep his position and power, you would think at this point right here he'd go, yeah, it's better if I kind of ratchet it down a little bit and, and save the kingdom and keep my position. Rehoboam replied, replied, verse 5, Go away for three days, and then return to me. So the people left. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon when he was alive, asking, How do you advise me to respond to this people? These are guys who knew exactly what Solomon had been doing. They knew exactly what these people were under. Okay, These, these are elders. They've been around a while. Smart guys, actually. They replied, Today, if you will 
be a servant to this people and to serve them. That, that's real leadership, servant leadership. If, if you'll serve them, because see, daddy's just been taken from them. If you'll serve them, okay, and this people, and if you respond to them by speaking kind words to them, they will be your servants forever. You want to hold the kingdom? Serve them. Be nice to them. Lower that down a little bit. That's pretty wise advice, actually. <clears throat> but he rejected the advice of the elders who had advised him. And he went and consulted with young men who had grown up with him and attended him. Puts off the older guys with all the wisdom and decides to go with the hot-headed, know-it-all youngsters that think they got it all figured out. They probably watched and saw, here's the power that, look, your father's had all kinds of power. And you know what? His, his inner group, they've had tremendous power. You need to keep that power because, hey, that also help us, won't it? So these hot-headed guys give the advice of this. He asked them, what message do you advise that we send back to this people who said to me, like the yoke your father put on us? And the brilliant young men said, who grew up with him, told him, this is what you should say to the people who said to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. This is what you should tell them. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. <laughs> I'm tougher than my daddy ever. That's big shoes to fill anyway. And my little finger is thicker than my father's. Although my father burned you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with barbed whips. That's horrible advice. Where did it come from, a bunch of young dudes? Okay. Those that think they got it all figured out. Y'all remember being young? Knew everything at that age, didn't you? <laughs> you find out not long into real life that you don't know as much as you thought. Okay? But they had this horrible advice. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, and the king ordered return to me on the third day. Then the king answered the people harshly. He rejected the advice of the elders that they had given him, and he spoke to them according to the young men's advice. <laughs> Can't you imagine? Here's Jeroboam. Here's Jeroboam. He's with the crowd. Rehoboam shows up with the advice not of the elders, but the advice of the idiots. I mean, the young men. Okay. He spoke to them according to the young men's advice. My father made you yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with barbed whips. The king did not listen to the people because this turn of events came from the Lord. God put it in their hearts. God's the one that's orchestrating this. Why? Remember that whole tearing apart thing? Okay. Now, God didn't have to do much to get young guys to make stupid decisions. Okay? And he sure didn't have to do much to get pride and the thought process of, hey, you know what, if you can, Rehoboam, keep all of Look at the vast wealth. Look at the vast power. We're going to be your inner circle. It didn't take much to get them guys to do all that. I mean, what? Do you really know any? Have you really known anybody who had power that willingly gave it up? It just doesn't happen. Not much, anyway. They didn't want to give that up. But God's the one okay, that was behind this. And as he carried out his word, which the Lord had spoken through Ahijah to, jo, uh, to Jeroboam. Okay? Solomon had become such an oppressor. Regardless of what happened in his final days, it just doesn't tell us a whole lot. But he had become such an oppressor and I think that he, because of what he had done, the way his character was and the way he had used people and done things, his own son Rehoboam walked around probably going, 
That's the kind of man I'm going to be like. Matter of fact, my daddy's waist is like that compared to what I'm going to be. And he sat up there waiting for the day that he got to take over and be in charge. Okay? His family got affected by what? By the way he acted in his character. Okay? He wasn't a shepherd of Israel at all. He was a user of Israel, and he didn't finish well. Okay? He even turned his back on the Lord and started into all kinds of idol worship. Okay? And not just that, he brought it in. Okay? So God used this prideful, bullheaded Rehoboam okay, to finish removing what? Removing it. What's going to happen? They're going to go away. And they're going to decide, you know what? Those ten tribes, we're going to anoint you, Jeroboam, your king. Jeroboam gets anointed king of Israel. He's the northern kingdom. Okay? And God makes a promise to him, hey, if you'll, if you'll walk with me and do all that, I'll make you a dynasty and you can be the, you'll be the king of Israel. He's going to screw up right quick too. And honestly, the tribes of or the northern kingdom, they're not going to have one good godly king. And they're going to go away first. God's going to destroy them first. Okay? At least... The kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, Judah, they will have a few throughout their history. They will have a few decent kings that will prolong their days in the land before God finally takes and sends them off into exile too. Okay. Solomon didn't finish well. He not only enslaved his people, but he it heavy put heavy burdens on them. He took the value of their lands for himself. It should have been for the people. He enslaved and took wealth of all those around him. He sold arms to their enemies, which I still can't figure that one out. But he sells arms to their enemies. He made all these political alliances with their enemies, not for the benefit of the people, but just his own self. Okay, so finishing well is important. Okay, it's easier to finish well when the character of God is your character. Okay. It's hard to finish well if you're walking your own game out. Okay? Character that becomes part of your whole life and character comes from really walking with the Lord. Okay? And character is the sum of all the parts, not pieces. Okay? See, character traits, you can have character traits. Hey, look, a hard worker. That's a, that's a work ethic. That's a character trait. Okay? But you can have somebody that's got a calm spirit, that's honest, faithful, all, all these traits, but you could still have what? Character flaws. They cannot be a person of character. Look, a hard worker, but he could be an oppressor. Okay? Solomon was. Somebody who's really smart and intelligent, but they can use that to what? Manipulate others. Character trait of being honest. Okay. But they could worship other idols. Okay. Characters are some of all the parts. Okay. Solomon's a good example of what the sum of all those parts weren't. Okay. But here's the thing. You can't change the past. Okay. Much as we'd like to sometimes. We can't change the past. Okay. But we can walk in a godly manner in the current. And guess what? The more you dig into God's Word, the more you start to become more like Christ. Guess what? All those character traits that you might be shaky in, God starts to what? Straighten them up. Somebody who's a liar, until God gets a hold of them, will remain a liar. But once God gets a hold of you, what will happen? He'll start straightening that up. Somebody who talks, you know, language is bad. Guess what happens? You know, one of the first things I noticed when I got right with the Lord, my language changed. Like that. Stuff that I said, all of a sudden, it just took it away. Okay? As you walk Lord with the Lord and you get closer with Him, you'll, any of those things, God will start to what? He'll start to pick them away. He'll start chiseling them away. Sometimes it hurts a little bit. And sometimes we rebel against it, right? 
But he won't leave you there because look, if God doesn't ever discipline you, you ain't one of his children. But one good way you know if you're a child of the Lord is what? He'll start working on those character flaws. And over time, he'll what? He'll get you more and more conformed to Christ. And more and more you get conformed to Christ, going back to the statement, get your character true north, start to look, act, and smell like what? Like the Lord. Okay. Solomon didn't finish well. Since I was getting out of college, it started bugging me then. What would happen if you get run over by a car and you're not? I, I would just, I'd hate that. And look, y'all know people that have died doing stuff they shouldn't have, right? You ever thought, I sure would hate if that was me? Not the dying part, but dying in the midst of something that you would not really want everybody to know? Okay. That's the idea of finishing strong. That's the idea of character. Okay. Solomon, good example of well, what not to be. Okay. No matter how much intelligence that we may think we have, just remember that that can do nothing but build pride and self-importance and all those type of things can start to what? Slowly let those little foxes in. We talked about the little foxes. And the slowly they get in. And all of a sudden, what happens? The snowball is going downhill and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? All right.